I uh, want to thank you folks for all coming out here today. That was, uh, I, I missed the first panel making my way over here, but uh, the second panel was tremendous. Um, so I'm going to be here discussing recent developments in uh, California insurance law. Um, I'm going to skip through a few of the cases, but uh, we'll start with we'll start with the uh, Supreme Court decisions. This is a case from last year, Century National Insurance Company versus Garcia. Um, this case was uh, kind of interesting, I thought, uh, in that uh, the po there's always an issue in, in policies with willful or intentional acts of the insured. And in this case, the language used in the policy was uh, if there is an intentional act of any insured, any insured, it is not covered. And courts have previously held that that language means what it says it means. If you've got three people that live in a home and one of them commits a willful act which causes the loss, you're not going to have coverage. The problem is, in this particular case, this was a fire policy, and what had happened was uh, the Garcia's adult son, who had some uh, mental, mental uh, disabilities, had started a fire in, clearly intentionally in the home, and they'd suffered a tremendous fire loss. Uh, and again, the policy said if there, is any if, if there are acts that are done by any insured that are intentional, we will not cover the loss. So the Garcia's made a claim against their carrier, and the carrier said, we don't owe any coverage on this case. But one of the things that the Court of Appeal pointed out is that, it, uh, is that Insurance Code Section 2070, which regulates all fire liability policies, says that all fire liability policies will be on the standard form. And if they aren't on the standard form, they will give this, the exact same coverage or better from the standpoint of the insured. Uh, and this was not a standard form policy. It used the word any insured on this particular issue. And the court pointed out that if you look at the at 2071, which is the standard form policy for fire insurance losses, it doesn't use the words it doesn't use the words uh, willful acts of the insured anywhere. But under Insurance Code Section 533, every policy of insurance has read into it in that Insurance Code section saying there is no coverage for willful acts of an insured. So the court said, okay, we're looking at a policy that has to be as good, if not better, from the standpoint of the insured than the general policy, which uses an insured trying to use the language any insured, which is more restrictive, doesn't benefit the insured, so we're not going to let that, that stand. So unfortunately for Century National here, there was coverage for the loss, even though it was caused by an insured of the policy. Our next case is one that uh, we've been waiting on for several years here now, State of California versus Continental Insurance Company. This was the Stringfellow uh, Hazardous Waste Site. Uh, and this is a case that as the, as the Supreme Court finally came out with their decision in August, as they point out, this is what they call a long tail loss. It was years and years of pollution and uh, waste damages. And you had also years and years of successive liability and excess insurance policies. Well, the issue that went up on appeal and up to the California Supreme Court in 2009 uh, on, this, on this particular case was the issue of stacking liability limits. Traditionally, under FMC versus Plystead, on continuous loss cases where you can have multiple policy years at risk, what the courts have said is there's no stacking of limits. An insured may have five million dollar policies and all five of them may be in play on a continuous loss such as construction defect or hazardous losses of uh, pollution types, but the insured's only going to get one policy limit. So each of those carriers may be on but up to the policy limit. The one, and a couple of the cases went over and said, okay, well then the insured gets to pick. So if the insured has a a half million dollar policy and has a, a million dollar policy, the insured gets this, they get the highest of the limits. Well, what the court of appeal, what the trial court and the court of appeal said in State of California versus Continental was, you know, there's nothing in the law against stacking. If the policy itself does not contain language that says there is no stacking of policy limits, there's no public policy reason against it. I mean, the argument was made in FMC versus Plystead that the insured gets a windfall if they get to stack five years of limits. But as the Court of Appeal and as the Supreme Court pointed out in this case, the insured's paying premiums on each of those years as well. And each year it's buying a million dollars worth of insurance, for example. So in, in this particular case, the court said that it, unless there's an anti-stacking language in policies, and we're seeing more of those, particularly in construction defect cases, and I'm sure we will in liability cases where they're dealing with pollution problems as well. Uh, but unless there's language against stacking, uh, the law of the land now is that these policy limits can be stacked. Um, this has actually got to be moved as of about a week and a half ago from significant pending. I should have, uh, 
should have uh, been a little quicker on the materials, but uh, this case actually the, court, the Supreme Court made its ruling on Kaiser Cement. This was another stacking issue that came up in this particular case. The issue here was there were multiple years of uh, policies with the same insurer on a, uh, on a continuous loss case, but the language in that particular policy said our policy limits will be the maximum of any policy limits. So they had seven or eight policies, each having half a million dollars worth of coverage, but the, the issue there is, well, do, doesn't that mean that you were going to get just the maximum of that 500000 for all those years combined? So the court, the court uh, dealt with that issue and said that that's how it worked out in that particular policy's language. But what Kaiser Cement went up to the, court of a, to the Supreme Court for was it said there's no real law or real basis for, no sta for not allowing stacking. So it had, been, it had been tracking along with the, um, with the state of California case. And now that that decision came out in August last month, the... Uh, the Supreme Court made a ruling on this case and basically sent it back down to the Court of Appeals and then down to the trial court saying, you know, follow the ruling of the uh, state of California. There can be stacking. Zhang versus Superior Court. This is one of the three cases I was going to talk about briefly today that talk about the fair claims practices and uh, the fair claims regulations, which, as you know, for 20 plus years in California, there's been no private right of action for bad faith against an insurer. Um, by third parties, uh, and there's also been decisions that have said that the fair claims regulations, since they're being administered and enforced by the Department of Insurance, you cannot sue on the fair claims regulations. We've got several cases here that are trying to push that envelope. In Zhang versus Superior Court, Mr. Zhang had a loss, I believe it was also a fire loss, and he was not happy with the way that his case was being handled and the way the claim was being handled. So he brought a lawsuit saying, here's all these things that carriers are required to do under, under the fair claims regs, and each of these actions also is sufficient to allow me to state a cause of action for violation of the unfair competition law. And, and so I'm, I'm going to sue them for violation of the unfair competition law based on these factors that a carrier has to follow under the fair claims regulations. The uh, trial court has said, you're just trying to bootstrap yourself into a, uh, a claim based on the, the private regs. You can't do that. The court of appeal has said, no, if these same factors also will support an unfair claims law action, then you can go ahead and sue. And frankly, anything that's going to be a violation of the fair claims regs sounds to me an awful lot like it's going to be a violation of the unfair claims, claims uh, laws, so unfair competition laws. So uh, this is an issue that uh, the Supreme Court took up back in 2010, and we're still waiting to hear what they're going to do with that one. Uh, Hughes versus Progressive was another another attempt to kind of shoehorn in and bootstrap around it. In this particular case, Hughes had his vehicle prepared, r repaired after uh, he'd had a, a loss, and his carrier was Progressive, and they said, your car will get fixed a lot quicker if you take it to, our, to one of our shops that's in our direct repair program, and your claim will get adjusted a lot quicker. And they didn't tell him, he, they didn't, according to his allegations, they didn't tell him that he had the right to go to any shop he wanted. Um, which is a violation of insurance code section 758.5 if in fact they didn't because that section says when dealing with an auto auto loss the insured must be advised that they have the right to take a vehicle to any shop that they want so Hughes in this case here they they sued and said you know you violated 758.5 and I'm I've uh, I'm going to bring a claim against you for that and what the carrier here said is well wait a minute 758.5 isn't part of the fair claims regs, which are in 790.03, but like the fair claims regs, it's administered by the Department of Insurance and it's enforced by the Department of Insurance. So therefore, just like the regs, you don't have a right to a private right of action for violation of 758.5. And what the Court of Appeals said in this case is, well, the difference there is the fair claims regs say the only, only method of enforcement is by the Department of Insurance. Uh, 758.5 doesn't have any language one way or the other on that, so the court said uh, the enforcement by the, by the commissioner is one way to go with this, but there's no reason not to have a, a cause of action based on the failure to do what you're supposed to do under this section. So that's where this stands at the Court of Appeals level, and so this is before the uh, Supreme Court, like Zhang, to be looked at as to whether the court's going to start allow allowing people to sue on these matters that previously have been just basically not a matter that supports a private right of action. Um, along those same lines, to an extent, is a recent case we have here, Dew versus Allstate, and forgive me, that's also, that's D-U, not D-U-E. This is a recent um, Ninth Circuit case interpreting, interpreting under California law, 
And in this particular case, Mr. Dew and three other occupants of a vehicle were involved in an accident uh, in 2005. Um, a few months after the accident, I think the accident was around June or so of 2005, in February of 06, uh, the third party defendant's carrier, Allstate, acknowledged that they were liable and responsible for this because pretty clear, pretty clear auto loss case. And so they said, you know, let us know what your client's damages are and let us know where things are going with this. Uh, and plaintiffs went through a couple of attorneys and things kind of festered for a while. And then ultimately, uh, in June of 06, the newer carrier sent all the bills along and said, hey, Mr. Dew has $108,000 worth of bills and our other three claimants have injuries as well. Uh, and you have a 100-300 policy and we'll take the 300 limits for all four of these people. And the carrier in June said, well, wait a minute, you know, we need to know more about these other claims. How, do we, how are we going to break this up? Who's getting what? We need to know a little bit more about this. Uh, but we would be happy to pay you the policy limits of 100000 on Mr. Dew's claim because that's the most he's going to get. Can we settle his and then look at dealing with the rest of these? The plaintiff refused to do that. They went forward to trial. And at trial, Mr. Dew got $4 million. Uh, the claim was assigned... The, the, the bad faith claim of the defendant was assigned to Mr. Dew, who then pursued the carrier and said that uh, you failed to settle this case and you failed to make an offer. Um, and in, in this particular case, remember we had a settlement demand of four, of, for four people of 300000 but nobody had ever made a settlement demand on Mr. Dew. And so the carrier said, well, wait a minute, we never had a demand. Uh, you, you can't say that we acted in bad faith in refusing a demand because we didn't have any demand to a plaintiff. And the Court of Appeals said, well, if you look at the fair claims regulations, carriers are required to make a reasonable settlement offer as soon as practical once liability is clear. And in this case, they'd admitted liability was clear. And so the, the issue was, yeah, do you have a duty to make a, to make a uh, settlement offer even if a plaintiff doesn't make, one of the, make a demand of their own? And the court, the Ninth Circuit here said, yeah, the carrier, they had a duty to make an offer as soon as it became clear and it was reasonable for them to do so. They had a duty to make an offer. However, they said in this situation, given that they got the bills in June, they made the offer on the one party in, you know, by August and then never had anything further from the plaintiff, they said the carrier didn't have a reasonable amount of time to make the offer. So the, quarter, the Ninth Circuit said, you know what, California, we think you're going to allow this kind of a decision, but we also are going to say it doesn't apply to this case that we're putting on. So I think it's kind of dicta, but uh, again, it's an attempt to bootstrap in some of the fair claims regs into a basis for claims against carriers. Not good. Um, we've got some miscellaneous liability cases here. Pacific Rim Mechanical Construction, Inc. versus Aon Risk Services. In this particular case, there was a construction defect claim. Uh, the general contractor was building a, building a project. They got a, one of the uh, OCIP wraparound policies issued for the whole project. All the subcontractors contributed into it. Uh, Pacific Rim Mechanical was one of the subs hired shortly after the project had begun, but they were, they were brought along on. They made their bid. They got involved. They got a contract, and they paid X dollars in towards the uh, premium for the OCIP policy. Well, unbeknownst to them, the carrier, uh, I believe it was Legion, the carrier went under, and, of course, the... The uh, broker notified the general, who had been the person who, who purchased the policy, but nobody ever, told, nobody ever told Pacific Marine Mechanical about this. So cut forward a couple of years later when the, when the construction defect case comes along and Pacific Rim finds itself out in the cold because it has no insurance other than that wraparound policy, which is no longer any good. So Pacific Rim sued the broker. They sued the general on various theories of negligence and failure to disclose that there had been no, that the, that the other insurance had gone out of business. And what the court said in this particular case is that um, the broker did not owe a duty of care to Pacific Rim, who, although premium dollars were paid by Pacific Rim, they weren't their client, uh, and they did not want to extend broker liability that far. Axis Surplus Insurance Company versus Glencoe Insurance. This was a... Uh, this was a case involving a uh, subrogation or a contribution claim. Uh, another construction defect case. In this one, Axis and Glencoe were successive carriers of the general contractor on the project. After they had problems come up with the project, uh, a lawsuit was filed, and the insured tendered to both Axis and to Glencoe. Glencoe had a $250,000 self-insured retention on its policy, and they said... Uh, 
They said, we're not, you know, we don't owe you any duty, any duties at all until you've satisfied the $250,000 SIR, but please keep us advised of what's going on. So, you know, some of the initial discovery took place. Experts were doing presentations. Uh, they'd come up with statements of claims. The numbers ran up to, I think, $10 million or so as the plaintiff's potential uh, damages. Uh, they ultimately ended up settling the case with, uh, with uh, the plaintiffs for a little over, I think it was a million and a half dollars or so, with a million dollar being contributed on behalf of the, of the, um, the insured, for the mutual insured for both Axis and Glencoe. Before the settlement, uh, Axis and the insured said to Glencoe, hey, look, we're going to go ahead and settle if that's okay with you. Glencoe's going to pay its 250000 The rest is going to come from Axis, the, the, one of the two carriers who was liable. So they paid their money. Uh, Glencoe, the carrier, the carrier who had the SIR, said, go ahead and do it. Uh, you have our blessing. Afterwards, Axis turned around and said, you were just as responsible as we were for, for this loss. We're both insurers of the same insured here. We paid. You didn't pay anything. We want money back on a contribution claim. And what the court here said is contribution is, is an equitable issue. So we're going to look at the equities here. And you both did have insurance for the same insured. And therefore, Axis is entitled to recover some of the monies that it paid back. And Glencoe's point was, wait a minute, I didn't owe them anything until those dollars were paid. And what the court there said is, you approved it. You said that it was OK for them to pay these monies. And you also, you've also admitted that, but for the fact that this $250,000 hadn't been paid, you would owe the duty to defend, and you would owe indemnity on the case. So because it hadn't participated in the settlement other than saying, OK, it couldn't contest the amount of the settlement, and because because it was uh, another carrier on the same risk, they had to pay their share. And I think, they, I think they split it actually a little bit more Glencoe's based on the time on risk. Um, California Paving and Grading versus Lincoln General Insurance Company. Uh, kind of a, a sh short, short uh, note on this case is essentially what happened here was paving contractor was working on a subdevelopment or on a development for a private general contractor who was building a, a project of homes. But those homes were part of a larger development that, they, that the developer had agreed to with the city, whereby they were doing various roads. So the roads that were involved were going to be city roads. They were part of a city contract between the city of LA and the general contractor. But the contract that the, that, that the um, subcontractor had was with the developer for a private contract. Um, they brought an action against the bond when they were not paid but they hadn't filed a 20-day preliminary notice. And the court said, you know, you're, you, you can't bring this claim because you failed to bond it. And the, and the, um, the plaintiff here, the paving and grading company, said, well, wait a minute. We're a private contractor. We don't have to post these same bond notices that you have to on a, pri on a public claim. And the court said, your, your general contract was pursuant to a larger public contract, so you do have to follow the notice requirement. Uh, so if you deal with those particular issues, keep in mind, mind what the ultimate contract is. And if you don't, that case probably doesn't mean a whole lot to anybody else. <laughs> but I, I thought it was kind of an interesting one just for that reason, is that ultimately you have to look at not just your client, your insured's contract, but who everyone else's contract is as well. Uh, Global Hawk Insurance Company versus Century National Insurance Company. This is a case where uh, we, had a, we had an accident involving uh, an a interstate trucking uh, company whose trucker rear-ended, uh, I believe it was a garbage truck driver, the truck that was being driven by the uh, interstate hauling company was not on their, was not one of the scheduled vehicles on their liabi auto liability policy, but they had an MCS 90 um, um, endorsement, which is required for anybody that participates in interstate trucking, which says that your trucks will be covered uh, if, one, there's no coverage for them under the underlying liability policy, and two, there is no one, there is no other insurance available to satisfy the, to satisfy the, um, liability of the, of, the motor, of the motorist at fault. Well, what happened here was uh, the vehicle wasn't listed on an ordinary insurance schedule. And so Global Hawk, or actually it was Century National, Century National in this case said, sorry, we have no coverage for this vehicle. And the MCS 90 doesn't provide coverage if there's other insurance. And the other insurance here happened to be the workers' comp carrier for the injured worker who who's, was just stopped there and was not at fault in the first place. So they didn't provide coverage under the MCS 90. So the injured employee went to his employer's, uh, I believe they went to workers' comp and UM, motor, UM coverage. And they got uh, $100,000 worth of uninsured motorist coverage. 
That was paid out by Global Hawk. Then Global Hawk turned around and said, okay, Century, you owe us this $100,000 because your driver was the one at fault. And uh, again, uh, Century said, no coverage here because we're not, we're not required to indemnify where there's other insurance. But what the Court of Appeals pointed out here is it's other insurance of the motor carrier who's at fault. And in this situation, Century's driver was at fault. So the other insurance that was available wasn't their, their driver's insurance. It was the insurance of the innocent third party. So the, the, the contribution of subrogation claim was upheld. Ortega versus Topa. This is a, this is a case involving, uh, again, section 758.5, which we talked about earlier on the, on the, um, the case involving the claim against uh, the chosen networks of uh, repair places. Well, Topa's policy <laughs> had an interesting provision in it. What they have on their, on their auto repair policy was right on the application, large box, and get paid 100% or you're or making me take only 80% if yeah. I go to a shop you of my own choice, which I'm allowed to do. 100% for repair of your vehicle if you go to one of our preferred shops. You have a right to go to another shop if you so choose, and, and in that situation, we will pay 80% of the repairs. Well, Mr. Ortega had his Mercedes repaired at one of uh, the the uh, direct provider shops for, for Topa. And on the policy, uh, and afterwards, in the box where it says what you're going to do with this policy, it has to be signed off on the application by the insurer. Before. So clear this is unfair. This is an unfair. This is a violation of the unfair competition laws because you're making me go. You're making me either go to this place and get paid 100 percent, or you're making me take only 80 percent. If I go to a shop of my own choice, vehicle, if you go to, to one of our preferred well, shops, what the court here said is you have a right to go to. It doesn't say that you cannot do this. It says you must. If you're going to have two tiers of coverage, you have to make sure that you're explicitly and expressly and clearly showing this. Nobody knows exactly what that is, but in this particular case, the court said this fits being expressed and being clearly shown on the on the application and on the policy. In the box where it says what you're going to do with this policy, it has to be signed off on the application by the insured. So clearly they had to see it. They may not have understood what it meant, but they had to see it. So the court said that in that particular situation, it's okay to have tiered coverage so long as if you go to that preferred shop, you are getting paid at least 100% because otherwise the carrier is, is in violation of the law. Pierce versus Western Surety Company. Uh, another another bond case. Uh, this is a this is a claim involving a, a sale of I believe it was a used car, and there was a claim brought against the bond company because surprise surprise the dealer was no longer uh, available to get a judgment against them. So the consumer sued under the bond, and they not only recovered but they were entitled to recover attorney's fees as well. Now under the under the uh, surety law, there's no basis for recovery of attorney's fees. So of course the surety company said, not fair. And they appealed. But the Court of Appeal said, well, when you're standing in the shoes of the consumer, or you are the consumer, if the consumer could recover against, could recover attorney's fees under uh, violations of the consumer repair laws, then when you're suing the bond company, you can get those same fees. And they recognize that in so holding, what this means is you're probably going to see a lot more disputes on bonds. They're probably going to see more of these go to, go to trial. And they're also probably going to see higher bond prices because now you've just opened up the uh, bond policies to attorney's fees as well. Um, liability cases, uh, duty to defend. I'm going to skip over Shanahan. We discussed that last year for those of you that were here. For those of you that weren't, um, the, lawyer, the lawyer who was being sued in this particular case said that even though she didn't sue me for negligence, she could have sued me for negligence, so you should have covered me for that. And they said, and, and the court said, Sorry, there's no allegation of negligence. It was actually not negligence, it was invasion of privacy, but you get the idea. Essentially, the, the defendant was trying to say, even though it's not pled in the complaint, a cause of action for this could have been brought, and therefore you owed me a duty to defend. And the, and the Court of Appeal said in the Shanahan case, you defend to the four corners of the facts and what the pleadings are. If someone wants to plead something differently, then you look at it then. But if there's not a pleading of a, of a cause of action out there, the carrier doesn't have to defend against a potential cause of action that could be raised. Uh, Clarendon America Insurance Company versus General Security. Um, you know, again, this just gets into uh, this gets into completed operations and the um, uh, the limitations on that one. We talked about that last year. I'm going to skip over that because we do have some newer cases I wanted to discuss. State Farm General Insurance Company versus Frake. Um, 
this is a case I, I want to point out, just not just because it's fun to talk about the facts, but also because it's important to remember that following the Delgado decision in 2009, uh, in which the court said, you know, if you if you if you defend yourself against, if you think you're defending yourself uh, against someone, you know, imperfect self-defense is not an accident. Uh, that was the Delgado decision. In the State Farm General Insurance Company versus Frake, the facts went a little different. It was buddies that had been friends since high school. They, um, they got back together. They would get back together all the time to do various things. And this one weekend they had, to me, sounds like one of the greatest guys weekends out. They went to a baseball game in Chicago on a Friday. Then they went to a, a football game that, over that weekend. And while they were doing that, the various friends, they would take turns hitting each other in and about the groin area. They'd been doing it since high school. And their mom, one of the guy's moms testified it was just their way. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was um, Frake, Frake had hit his friend King in the groin. He actually hit him in the groin. And I guess when he did it, according to the fact pattern, he, he screamed out triumphantly, yes, you know, because he actually had hit him there. Because uh, sometimes they would just fake doing it, sometimes they would do it. So he hit it, he said yes, and then they went on their business, and this was the, the baseball game. A couple days later at the football game, still nothing going on, but later, after that weekend is, has ended, uh, Frake hears that King has been injured and that uh, he's going to be sued, and he ends up having about $75,000 worth of medical bills and sues him. And the carrier, doesn't, the carrier refuses to defend because they said, it's an intentional act, you tried to hit him. And Frake said, yeah, but I didn't want to hurt him. And the court said, no, an intentional act that's followed by damages that uh, directly followed by damages that are caused by that intentional act, there's going to be coverage for that unless there's some unknown super intervening fact. And in fact, there's another, another case we had out there uh, in 2011, which I, I kind of enjoyed for its fact pattern. And in that one, a couple of fellows were horse wrestle, horse, horsing around at a pool party, and the one guy threw the other guy into the pool. And when, he fell, when, he, when the fellow was thrown into the pool, unfortunately, he landed on the steps and broke his arm. And what the different courts said, this is, uh, I think this is the second district, I think it was the fourth district in the other case. What they said in the other case is they said, yeah, he intended to throw him, but he didn't intend to cause injury. And he didn't know the steps were right there. So I think even under the state farm facts, you could make the argument that those two, are, those two cases can be reconciled. Because here, he, he knows he's hitting the guy. He's got to expect there's going to be an injury. The other one, he's throwing him into water. He wouldn't expect to break somebody's arm throwing them into water. So I think those two can be reconciled. But basically, if you intend to, if you commit an act intentionally, uh, if this, even if you didn't intend to injure the person, that's not going to be an accident under a general liability policy. Uh, California Traditions versus Claremont. Um, Briefly on this one, I, I, I try not to overload too many construction defect ones, but I, 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 we get a lot of those cases in coverage, obviously. In this particular project, the, the uh, subcontracting, I believe it was the framer, had an exclusion in his policy against building condominiums and townhomes. And he submitted a, he submitted a bid to the general contractor uh, to build the homes. He said, these aren't townhomes, are they? And he goes, no, no, not at all. And they didn't look like townhomes. They're single-family homes. Um, they, had, they didn't have zero, complete zero lot lines. They didn't share common walls. But for tax and for uh, FHA and other purposes, they were marketed as townhomes by the developer builder. Unfortunately for the framer, he didn't know that. And he was, in fact, it was, in fact, misrepresented to him by the builder that these weren't townhomes. So he went ahead and did the work. Unfortunately, there were construction defects involved. And the carrier said, sorry, we don't cover this. And um, so what happened was the builder, the builder took an assignment of claims from the framer and went ahead and sued them and said, wait a minute, he didn't know that these were townhomes. <laughs> and since at that point, basically, you're taking an assignment and there is some equity to it, the court said, he didn't know because you lied to him. <laughs> so <laughs> you're not going to be able to do that. So although these homes had been marketed as condominiums, they didn't look like it, so the, uh, the, the, the even, even where they were, even, they, even if they didn't look like it, they were condos and townhomes and they were excluded under the policy. Uh, Ultra Salon, I'm going to skip over. It's a yucky nail case and I just, we don't want to talk about that on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> um, Travers Property Casualty Company of America versus Charlotte Roos Holding Company is kind of a fun case. I like this one because uh, the problem here was a company called uh, uh, Versatile various versatile industries were going to, were going to uh, put out a line of clothing called People's Liberation. And they wanted to sell them just in the high-end stores. They wanted to... K 
cater to a group of uh, people that, uh, that they thought would be buying higher end clothing, would pay top dollars for their products. And so they went with uh, Charlotte Russe Holding uh, as a company to distribute their products. And Charlotte Russe said, yeah, we can do that. You know, we, we, we want to get into the Neiman Marcuses. We want to get into the, you know, the better stores. We'll be happy to do this. Well, they didn't have a lot of experience with those particular types of clothing. Uh, and they either misjudged their market or whatever, but very soon thereafter, these clothes were being sold, uh, marked 70, 80% off. Big red fire sale signs in the windows saying, <laughs> buy these here. And Versatile is going, wait a minute, you've taken our label and turned it into, you know, junk. This is horrible. And they sued them for, uh, they, they, them for they sued them for disparagement of, uh, of their product. And the carrier, Traveler, said, we don't owe you a defense under this uh, because They've, they've sued, but they haven't shown that you've actually libeled their product. They haven't shown that you've actually said something that wasn't true about it. And what the court pointed out is that in the typical policy, uh, typical liability policy for these types, of, these types of claims, both the liability and the personal injury policies had an exclusion for coverage that arose out of disparagement or libel. Um, and uh, in this particular case, the use of the word disparagement was separate from the word libel. And in this case, the court said, it's pretty clear they made out a cause of action that you've disparaged their goods by taking a high-end product and putting it for sale with huge red tags, you know, the, putting it in the windows 80% off. Uh, they said even if that didn't amount to libel, it certainly would be disparagement. So uh, that's the type of claim it was, and it wasn't covered. Uh, Enton versus Superior Court. Uh, this was an issue where the, uh, the issue that came up was whether, this, whether the insured on, a, on an... Um, long-term disability policy was actually totally disabled for purposes of the policy. Uh, the carrier disputed it. I believe it was a doctor. And the carrier had said, you know, we don't think he's completely unable to do the type of mostly sedentary work that he does, but we're going to continue to pay the benefits while we dispute this. So they continued to pay his long-term disability benefits. They reserved their rights. They had him seen by a doctor. They had his records inspected. And they came to a determination that he was not totally disabled. So they therefore filed a declaratory relief action. And in the declaratory relief action, they said, we will continue to pay this long-term disability until the court says we don't have to. So the position of the carrier was, what are we looking at here? We're looking at a declaratory relief action, which is equitable in nature, which means not necessarily a right to a jury trial. Well, what the Court of Appeal here said is, we're really looking at what does totally disabled mean. And it's not a contractual, it's not a contractual interpretation because nobody's disputing what the language there says. We're looking at whether under the facts as we know them, this guy is totally disabled. That's a factual dispute. It's something that the insured has a right to a jury trial. So even though the carrier is doing everything it could to try and limit what the action was really about to just an equity claim, the court said, no, he has a right to have a trial by jury as to whether he's totally disabled. Um, I'm going to skip to Richards versus Sequoia. Richards versus Sequoia Insurance Company. Uh, this was a case, I, I believe it was, the uh, insureds were owners of a, uh, of a hotel or a lodge or a bar and grill uh, who also happened to be lawyers. Husband and wife were both lawyers. And there was, uh, there was a claim involving an underage minor who'd gotten drunk, gotten in an accident, and had a bad injury. And the claim was brought against the the lodge slash grill uh, insureds. They tendered to the carrier, and the carrier the carrier said, "You know, we'll t you know we'll, we we know you've given us this complaint. It may take us a little while to take a look at it. We're not sure if we can we're not sure if we can give you a decision within the time limit, which by this point was less than 30 days from when they've been served with the summons. We're not sure if we can get an answer to you before then. So you might want to hire your own lawyer to uh, get an answer on file on your behalf. Uh, if there's coverage, we will pay." That lawyer, we will pay for that answer, uh, and uh, we'll let you we'll we'll let you know as quickly as we can. And about 17 days later, it was either 13 or 17 days later, the carrier came back and said, "Okay, we're going to cover. We're reserving our rights, but we're going to cover this case." And they picked up the defense at that point. They paid the rest of the lawyer's fees. They settled the case. And afterwards, the two insureds brought an action for bad faith when the carrier refused to pay them $30,000 for their time in the two weeks that they said they spent. I think it was. Uh, 40 hours each, they said that they spent researching uh, issues for their claim and they wanted to be paid. And what the court there said is, you know, it, it's like any other, it's like any other, pl uh, any other um, damages claim. Uh, a plaintiff who is also an attorney may not recover their own attorney's fees for time spent because they, they have not incurred it. 
Benke versus State Farm, it's a cumus issue. Uh, in this particular issue, the carrier, the carrier had uh, accepted the defense under a reservation of rights. They let the insured use the lawyer of their own choice, but right off the bat they said we're going to reserve our right to, um, to claim, uh, we're going to reserve our cumus rights as to whether these are reasonable attorney's fees under this guy's fee schedule or not. They went ahead, resolved the case, they paid about $65,000 worth of attorney fees, uh, or actually I think it was $135,000, and they were left with a bill of about $35,000 at the end, or $45,000 that, that the attorneys said was still owed, and they said, no, that's not reasonable, you know, we'll, we're, we're not going to pay that. So the carrier brought a petition to compel arbitration uh, over the fees under, under uh, Civil Code Section 2860, the CUMA statute, to say, we want to arbitrate what is legitimately a fee dispute with the CUMA's counsel. Um, the trial court said no, you know, that you, you, uh, you have not, uh, you've not shown that you had defended this case and that you're entitled to, to uh, have an arbitration of this issue. That went up to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal said no, this is the only issue that they did dispute was whether they were paying the right amount of attorney's fees. So by the time it had gone up on appeal, they'd actually arbitrated and the carrier had paid it. So the fact that the carrier had paid the fees, the fact that they'd, the only thing they disputed was the arbitration of reasonable fees, that was why there could be no basis for a bad faith claim. Um, DeWitt versus Monterey Insurance Company. Uh, this, is a, this is a kind of a slightly convoluted case, but the bottom line is there was a party at an apartment building. There was a property manager for the apartment building, an owner for the, prop for the building, and they were both named insureds under the Monterey Insurance Company liability policy. It's New Year's Eve. Uh, again, a couple of miners are at the party drinking, one drives out, the other one was either injured or, or killed, and a lawsuit follows. The carrier defended the owner of the property, they defended the property manager, they did not defend Mr. DeWitt initially, who was, by some people stated to be the de facto manager on site of the, of the property. Initially they refused to defend him, they claimed that he was not uh, their insured, they claimed he was not listed as the type of person that would, was covered under the policy. Offers were made. They ended up getting the other parties settled out. A demand was made of DeWitt uh, to, to settle DeWitt's case for about, I think it was $4, four million. They ended up settling it for three and a half. Uh, and thereafter, DeWitt brought a claim saying, you know, all that time you didn't defend me, that's bad faith, and I, was, I had emotional distress and all kinds of issues. And so DeWitt sued them, and at, at trial, one of the jury instructions that DeWitt wanted to be, have given was he didn't want to give an instruction that said to ask the jury whether there was a duty to indemnify as well as a duty to defend. They, they didn't want to get into the duty to defend and indemnify for some reason. But he wanted to have an instruction that said where a carrier refuses a settlement demand, has a, where a carrier's been defending and has a duty to, or, and has a duty to defend uh, and refuses a reasonable settlement offer, that is evidence of bad faith. That's a pretty standard jury instruction. But the problem here was the carrier hadn't been defending him. So the, and the court recognized that as much, and they said you can't use that instruction in this situation. So ultimately, the, the, the problem the court said was, even though there turned out to be a duty to defend here, you've never established they had a duty to indemnify. And without a duty to indemnify, you ultimately cannot have bad faith for failing to pay. Uh, let's see, a couple cases left here. Um, I'm going to skip over to Western Heritage. Um, again, 2011, but this is a good case because in this particular case, it was a home care worker who was driving a vehicle and uh, the, person was, uh, their, the person entrusted in their care was injured in an, uh, in an automobile accident. The carrier, Western Heritage, defended both the owner of the company and defended the driver of the vehicle, the home care person. Uh, but unfortunately, after they'd answered a complaint on her behalf, she disappeared and she never responded to discovery, didn't show up for deposition. So during the course of the trial, her answer was stricken and a default was entered against her. The carrier sought leave to intervene and um, this was granted, but the, court, the trial court said you can intervene, but you don't get to contest damages um, or, or liability. You, you can just intervene. Uh, and they took that up on appeal and the Court of Appeal said no. In a situation where the carrier has reserved its rights but has been defending, it stands in the shoes of its insured and it can contest both liability and damages. One? Uh, okay, if we've got one minute left, let's talk about uh, access surplus insurance versus Renoso. 
This is another intentional action. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Reynoso were owners of property, uh, a bunch of properties in Southern California. Over 30 years, they'd owned hundreds of apartment and other units. Um, they were units that were generally substandard. They were units that were generally rented at lower rates to persons that were generally on assistance. Uh, and uh, as the phrase there, slum properties, I believe, was the phrase the court used on it. The husband had been managing them. They had a property manager, but the husband was handling day in and day out activities on it. And in fact, he had twice been convicted of operating properties that were below standard uh, and had, had, uh, had to, uh, he'd had convictions for that. And the wife, she'd been married to him at that time. She knew about his convictions. Now she said the only involvement she had with this particular property that ended up being part of a habitability suit was she paid the bills. Well, the carrier went ahead and settled the claim for about $2 million. And after they settled, they turned around and sought the money back from both Mr. and Mrs. Reynoso. And Mrs. Reynoso objected and said, wait a minute, I'm an innocent insured. I didn't know anything about these types of, these types of claims, so you, you can't expect to get your money back from me. And what the court said here is, look, you knew enough of your, what was going on with this particular business. You knew the conditions on this property based on the fact that you were paying bills and what kinds of bills you were paying, and more importantly, what kinds of bills you weren't paying, maintenance, repair, those types of things. So she knew the condition that these were in. And so ultimately, what they said in this situation was the condition of these properties was expected and intended from her standpoint, so therefore they're not an accident and there's no coverage for her for this loss. And I, I, the, to me, on, these, on some of the habitability claims, that's going to be one of the bigger issues to watch out for is to what extent it can be deemed that these were uh, expected or intended from the standpoint of the insured. Uh, we got to have a question back there? In the bus situation, they said that you had to go through, the carrier had to go through a lot of antics to be able to prove what was not covered and what was covered and what bills should be paid and all that other stuff. In this case here, it was like, no, the mere fact that it wasn't covered, they don't have to, the, obviously the bills are the bills, so you owe to pay them. Well, it was a, it was a judgment is what it was there. They, or, or it was not a judgment, but it was a settlement uh, with the plaintiffs on the case. and. Yeah, that was there. There were there were arguments about coverage there as well. But what the court said is, you know, there was no duty to defend. There was no duty to defend the insured in this situation. They put the insured on notice they were going to settle. And if you put your insured on notice you're going to settle, unless they want to take over their own defense, you're you're entitled to do that under the Blue Ridge case. So, in this particular case, the insureds knew they were going to settle. The insured took the chance that okay, they might be able to get away with saying, you know, Mr. Reynoso knew about this, so there's no coverage for him. But hey, community property, we live together. You're not going to be able to stick me with those bills, and it's not fair or reasonable to stick my community property with his bills on that. So they probably thought they'd be safe with that. But the court said, if there's no, du no duty to defend and there's no duty to indemnify here, but you did so and you put your insured on notice you're going to do so, you can recover those monies. Yeah, I just was thinking maybe perhaps that the requirement of the court in the bus had been laxed or, re or lessened yeah. in this case because they... You know, they didn't even address the bus standard yeah, at I know, all. I, yeah, yeah, well, they only mentioned it in there. They didn't, they didn't yeah. go through and say... They mentioned it just for the same propositions yeah. they were relying on. They didn't go through the, the vehicle of that, yeah. Um, I think I'm out of time, and we want to give Tammy uh, as much time as we can for her. I will be around afterwards if anybody has any other questions. I want to thank you for your time. And uh, like I said, I'll be here after the break. <laughs>